All right. Here we go. It is Boston Marathon Week. And so what I thought would be fun this week is walking through the history of the Boston Marathon from its start in 1897 to the present. I got three great books that I'm going to use to go do that. Uh, two of them, well, actually all of them are written by um, Tom, how do you say his last name? Durderian, Tom Durderian. Those are the three books. And I thought it'd be fun to kind of walk it through one at a time and maybe share some of my thoughts on the Boston Marathon as we go through it. Um, let's see if you guys have any questions. Let me actually do that. Okay. So, do, 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 do. and then when I'm done with this, I'll probably go from 1897 to maybe World War I, and then I'll stop. And I got to get my run in today, too, and then we'll go from there. So, hmm, which book do I start with? I think they're actually probably the same. When was this one published? This one was published in 1994. And this one was published in... This one was published in. Da, 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 da. This one was published in 2017. Yeah, we're gonna go with this one to start. Okay, all right. So let's focus on this book, the Boston Marathon. Okay. So. Chapter one is from 1897 to 1909. And here are the names of the different races. 1897, we have the start at Metcalf's Mill. 1898, Ronald McDonald. 1899, Larry the Blacksmith. 1900, Jack Cafferty and Bill Sherry. 1901 is Ronald McDonald's return. 1902 is his strenuous life. Then we go... The Defiance of the Doctor, Streak of Yellow, Joker Goes Wild, Rather Slow, Plumber's Help, The Most Favorite, No Favorite at All, and The Inferno. So that takes us through 1909. Let's do that, and then we'll go from there. All right, so let's start with the first one. Some pretty good pictures in here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, 1897 to 1909, the first marathon runners. Let's talk about 1897. 1897, the race was won by Jay McDermott from New York. His time was 255.10, which was a course record and a world record. 255.10. A lot of you guys are running 255.10. Let's work through this chapter. All right. 18 men. April 19th, 1897. Monday, April 19th, 1897, at 12.15 p.m., Tom Burke dug his heel into one side of the hard and narrow dirt road in front of Metcalf's Mill in Ashland, Massachusetts. He dragged his heel to the other side of the road and stood there about 25 miles west of the Boston Athletic Association track on Irvington Street in the Back Bay. As the double gold medalist sprinter from the first modern Olympic Games held in Athens the previous year, Burke was the most celebrated member of the association. Thus came to him the distinction of starting the runners in a new kind of race in America, a marathon. There had been only one other kind in the country. Burke drew the line without ceremony. The race needed a starting line and he had his boots on. Burke called out numbers for 18 men, 15 answered, and stood next to the scuff line. Burke had no gun. Exactly 1219, he shouted, go, to start the Boston Athletic Association Marathon. Officials of the BAA observed the race with pride, knowing they had created something important. Reporters from all over the Boston newspapers had come to watch. Burke and the BAA's John Graham had arrived with the reporters by the 912 train from the DNA Railroad Station on Boston's Nealon Street. 
The, that Monday morning, Patriots Day train from Boston to Ashland, both with the wheels and equipment of the Company B, 2nd Regiment, and the Ambulance Corps, both of whom would accompany the Peds along their route by bicycle to see their needs. Grant had represented the Boston Athletic Association when he attended the Olympic Marathon, the world's first in Athens in 1896. The appeal of long-distance running centered on its danger. The ancient Greeks had no marathon or any such long race in the Olympic Games. But every American and European schoolboy had heard of the sacrifice of Philippides, the Greek soldier who, it was told, ran from the plains of Marathon to Athens to announce the Greek victory over the invading Persians and then dropped dead. The lesson was obvious. Someday, you too may be called the sacrifice for your country. So the Olympic Games had to have a long race. The first modern Olympic marathon was, a, was won by a Greek water carrier named Spiridon Lewis. It ran from the plains of Marathon through the flat village of Rafina, down the hills, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All right. The officials from the BA set up to design a course to match the original in Greece. They picked for the start. They, they picked for the start of Sparta Ashland, 25 miles west of the nearest thing they had to the stadium, the 220-yard Irvington Street Oval that served as running track. The Oval did not have 50,000 seats or even a chip of marble. The Newton Hills weren't a very close match for the hills of Athens. And Ashland, unlike Marathon, was not a plane, but the railroad did run in that direction. So the idea was the course was going to mimic uh, the course of the Boston Marathon. It's kind of interesting, of the original Athens Marathon. The night before the first Boston Marathon, the six runners from New York, including Hamilton Gray and John and John J. McDermott, took their evening meal together in the dining room at the Central House in Ashland at a table apart from Boston runners. Long before the days of carbohydrate loading, the meal for marathon and the night before the race, like that of a soldier on the eve of battle, took on the importance of the biblical Last Supper. McDermott and Gray, gaunt and lean, looked like they had trained well for distance running. One Boston observer noted that neither carried an ounce of superfluous flesh. Clearly a rivalry quickly developed between the host of Bostonians and the invading New Yorkers. Moments after the start, Dick Grant seized the lead. He was the only man in the field on, without a handler to give him water and attend to his needs. Bostonians had their hopes and money on Grant, a Harvard man with a background in track racing. He felt the bright sun on his right soldier and a cool west wind on his back. He felt the stiff leather shoes on his black leather shoes slap the hard dirt road. Cross-country Hamilton Gray, running for the St. George Athletic Club in New York, followed him in match strides. They made little puffs of dust with each unified football. The Boston Globe reporter's post-race story and the lurid prose of the day that the sleepy old town rang with the cheers for lusty sons. As Grant and Gray ran, Gray's handler rode up and handed him a water canteen. He took a drink. They handed the rest to Grant. The two certainly felt the competition, one against the other, but they also had a common cause against the enormous distance. Fear 25 miles bound them. What would happen to the human body while trying to race that distance with unknown? A man could drop dead, use himself up, shorten his life, or more likely break down and never reach Boston. So great was their respect for the distance that J.J. Kernan, representing the St. Bartholomew A.C. of New York, and John J. McDermott, a lithographer by trade of the Pastime Athletic Club in New York, ran softly 30 yards behind hard-running Granny Gray at South Framington. McDermott, at 123 and a half pounds, was the only man in the field who had won a marathon, the only other one in America. The Knickerbocker AC sponsored the first American race from Stanford, Connecticut to New York City in 1896. That race had been a muddy slog, only a third of the field had finished, and it, did not, it had taken McDermott three hours and 25 minutes to do it. He traveled at a much faster rate now, but he did not know if he could keep up the pace. The newspaper considered McDermott the man who had reached Boston first, but no one knew much about what happened in the race. After leaving South Framington, the cyclist fell into a line as he spun up a cyclone of dust. People on horseback and wagons followed. The loose road dirt rose on the spokes of each wagon wheel, then spilled off in cascades of dust. The paper described that the houses all along the line were filled with people, and many handkerchiefs and good wishes were wafted upon the beautiful April day as the men with the faces set kept on it. The papers further reported that as Grant passed Wesley College, the girls lined in the streets cheered, raw for Harvard, as if they were all at a football game. Behind Grant, McDermott ran with beautiful form. 
McDermott caught the leaders on the hills between Wesley and Newton. He took the heart out of Gray, who stopped to walk, who hasn't walked up the Newton Hills. They were doing it all the way back in 1897. He had the speed to match McDermott, but McDermott's cautious early pace, his experience with the previous marathon, and probably greater conditioning allowed him to continue without slowing. Grant did not dare drop back. He wanted to win, so he clung for a while to his relentless tiger on a downhill and to the base of the next hill. There, Grant staggered a few steps and quit running. McDermott continued. Grant walked to the top of the hill, arriving just in sign to see McDermott turn the corner and disappear. Seeing a street watering cart used to keep dust down in the town roads, Grant signaled the driver to stop. Grant lay in the street and asked the driver to run water over him. Once refreshed, he tried to run again, but his feet were too badly blistered. He hobbled. Dick Grant trained to race on the track. The man with the greatest speed in the field was forced to leave the race, but the race would not leave him. The idea of running the Boston Marathon would not leave him. At Audenburg, McDermott commanded nearly a mile lead. The churning and mobile bicycling, buckbird, horseback, electric car crowd gathered around him so closely that his attendants had to work to keep the path open. McDermott plodded on in a pandemonium of dust. He asked attendant Eddie Hurdleman to tell them when he had passed 20 miles. At the Evergreen Cemetery, a quarter mile from the Chestnut Hill Reservoir, McDermott stopped to walk for the first time. He walked 220 yards, then suddenly sprinted for 200 more until a violent cramp seized his left leg. He stopped in Highland, pummeled his leg vigorously to exercise the cramp amid the applause of the spectators. Many thought he was gone, finished, and regardless of position in the lead, he would have to retire from the race. But he held his leg stiff and yelled to Hamlin, rub! Hamlin tore at the cramp with his fingers and held the quirting muscle fibers apart until they relaxed. The cured McDermott jumped back into the race and ran on Beacon Street to Coolidge Corner and St. Paul Street, where he walked to Carlton Street. Blisters filled his shoes and the skin had begun to peel off the soles of his feet. Ugh. When he heard that a runner had just come over the hill, he shut his teeth and set his face and leaning well forward, dug his shoes into the hard Beacon Street. Spectators said that he ran up the hill like a half miler and down the other side to Commonwealth Avenue and across Massachusetts. There, sweaty and dusty, he plunged into the dignity of a funeral procession as it moved along Massachusetts Avenue. He so startled the drivers of two electric cars that they stalled their vehicles. At the Irvington Oval Spectators, at the at, at the Irvington Oval, spectators filled every available foot of standing room. The fences were black with boys, young men, and women. They watched the BAA open handicap games and track and field meet where slow runners started sooner so that often the races became a great catch-up drama and better fodder for wages, etc. The crowd pressed forward wishing to grasp the hand of the winner, the first marathon runner. McDermott now weighing 114 pounds, so he's lost 10 pounds now in the race. Eee. Uh, ran to the track and completed the 220-yard lap in exactly 40 seconds. The crowd pressed forward, which in the grass behind of the winner, the first marathon runner in Massachusetts. The police forgot their duty. The crowd hoisted McDermott onto the shoulders. It was the hardest kind of reasoning that he punched someone that he escaped and ran to the BAA clubhouse. Newspaper proclaimed that McDermott time of 255.10, 10 seconds faster than the than Spirit and Lewis had run in Greece and faster than he himself had run six months earlier, was a new world record. And that McDermott was the marathon champion of America and the world. Grant is the hardest man I ever beat, McDermott told the Globe reporter. He held me for a mile, although he was all pumped out. If he had trained for the race, he would have given me a hard race. And as it was hard enough to shake him, he ran the pluckiest race I ever saw. McDermott examined his feet. They would probably be my last long run. I hate to be called a quitter or a coward, but look at my feet. They were bloody and blistered and the skin peeling off. But Grant and McDermott would be back. And so were Lawrence Brignolia, a 20-year-old Cambridge oarsman, finishing over an hour behind the winner. The Globe reporter described Brignolia as the modest, genial fellow, had a wonderful physique and confidence. He had been apprenticed to a horseshoe until the age 15. Before the race, Brignolia had been persuaded to take a big breakfast to prepare him for the ordeal, but he had gotten cramps while running. The 160-pound Brignolia finished in 406, but would train, eat carefully, and be back too. Wow. And there's a cool picture in here.
talking about what the first kind of incidents from the first race, which is kind of neat, I think. So McDermott won in 255.5. The 10th place finisher ran in 410. That's pretty cool. Hmm. So then we come back next year in 1898. April 19, Boston Daily Globe ran the front page headline, Cuba Fee Free. The U.S. armored cruiser Maine had been blown up in the Vanna Harbor in February with the loss of 260 American lives. The country clamored for war with Spain over Cuba and did declare war on April 25th. The U.S. supported the Cuban insurrectionists. Along the 1898 marathon route, flags replaced the waving handkerchiefs of the previous year. American expansionists wanted Hawaii and the Philippines, too. The U.S. population had doubled since 1820, and the per capita output of manufacturing multiplied four times. 25 men came to run the second race, so 18 to 25. A curly and light-haired 22-year-old Boston college student named Ronald McDonald, who had come to Boston at the age of nine from his birthplace in Nova Scotia, rode the train to Ashland Station. He weighed 142 pounds, stood five foot seven, and wore a pair of common bicycle shoes. Unbelievable. A noble, nearly hearty look shot from his eyes as he posed for a newspaper sketch. He had never run a marathon before, but had been running for the Cambridge Gym for three years and had won the July 4th mile handicap race in Newton. He had also won the New England three mile championship and three weeks earlier, he had won an 18 mile cross country race. The pundits predictors favored the 1897 winner, John McDermott, who had said he wouldn't run another marathon race, but there he was. Most of the runners took the 830 train from Boston. The Globe reporter saw them. Sauntering through the station came eight or ten healthy, rugged-looking men in clad sweaters, small caps, and carrying small grips. At the start, Tom Burke took a stout piece of pine instead of his heel to scratch the starting line of the dirt road, but starter Doc Moran had to wait because some men were missing. They arrived on the next train to join the leaders in the start that took them through the first five mile through the, through the first mile and five minutes flat. Wow. I guess it is downhill. McDermott ran in a pack of five with elbows touching down the dusty road to framing him. Hamilton Gray followed. Spectators and interested parties tagged along. Carriages and a few other motor wagons and equestrians followed as far as Nautic, where they dropped, but others took up the chase. It was a dry day and frequent collisions added to the din and dust. Dust rose in a thick cloud until the runners and bicycle riders resembled flour millers. The use of noisemakers annoyed at least one observer. The clinging of gongs and the constant ringing of bells was hideous. Young boys and men rode their bicycles alongside their favorite runners and whispered words of encouragement or advice. Members of Company B 1st Regiment had their hands full trying to keep a clear path through the ever forward leaning crowds. Somewhere between Wesley and Newton Lower Falls, O'Connor disappeared from the course and McDonald showed himself. He had been running two to three miles behind the leaders, but they may have been, but they may have been a method in his tactic, as was tentatively observed by the astute Globe writer. Quote, he was noticed apparently awake at a stupor, throw his head back, and start running in an altogether different style. The pursuit was on. McDonald waste, wanted the lead. Gray led an Auburn circle, but it could not shake Estapi. The runners doled up the hill, dueled up the hill. The attending cyclists had to dismount their bikes and walk. <laughs> <laughs> the reporter found it painful to watch the runner's expressions of agony. Still, McDonald came on. A child from McLean's attendance told him that McDonald was gaining. He appeared to be trying a desperate strategy, and many thought he would sizzle himself in the process. He sprinted downhill. His attendants whispered that he may have gone daft. Gray had passed McLean to take the lead again at Coolidge Corner. Gray had only 50 yards. He saw McDonald. The Globe reporter tried to sort out what was happening. McDonald saw victory, but Gray was determined not to be beaten. But perhaps Gray, by letting McDonald gain, was playing the fox. By St. Paul Street, McDonald burst again, and now Gray could hear his footsteps. At Kent Street, McDonald caught Gray. With all their bursting spent, they moved like a menacing fighter circling molasses. 
Ever so slowly, McDonald pulled away. Gray could do nothing but persevere, alternating walking and running. But McDonald never stopped running and took no liquor during the entire race. Unbelievable. According to the Globe reporter, McDonald did not enter the Irvington Oval lightly. With a mighty bound, he landed in the center of the cinder path. Boyd's gathered to run to the finish line with him like a bodyguard. Past the line, the crowds hauled McDonald to their shoulders and carried him. They set him down in time for Gray's finish. The two shook hands. Ten minutes later, Larry Bignoli, the oarsman and apprentice of Horseshoe Man, the man with the rippling physique, finished over an hour and ten minutes faster than the year before. Wow. Hmm. So now McDonald wins. McDonald wins. Gray gets second. McDermott gets fourth. That's 1898. 1899. So, 1899. Larry the Blacksmith. Subtitle, Grant's third attempt for victory. Okay. Mm-hmm. Let's start. All right. The race starts. So why Larry the Blacksmith? Well, it says, before the Ashland started, doctor examined the 17 starters and pronounced each one a fit. So now we're back to 17 people. John Graham fired a pistol to start the race. 29 minutes later, four leaders, a hound dog named Prince, and their attendants, the lead detail from Battery B, First heavy artillery under the command of Captain Walter Lombard reached South Framington. According to the Globe Reporter, sent into the necessary uh, nautical terminology of the day, against their faces pressed half a gale of wind. So they're running into a headwind in 1899. <laughs> the curious sailing terminology used in describing the early races, beating, quartering, wind, overhaul, heave to, fetch, reach, disappeared in later years. The big man at 161 pounds, blacksmith Larry Brignolia, ran with Dick Grant and two others. Following a respectable distance, ran three members of the Highland Club, two named Sullivan and one named Herringen. Okay. Between Nautic and Wesley, Brignolia and the dog prince seemed to allow Grant to, to lead. Grant, ever the Harvard man, entered Wesley with a 25-yard lead to Grant a brevity of pretty girls, all gowned and fashionable and very colored gowns but with Crimson predominantly shouting for the Harvard man. Some things never change. Men realized nearby that women cheered only for the Harvard runners, so out of a sense of fair play and balance, they instead gave their cheers to the blacksmith. As may be expected, the blacksmith was more than a mere horseshoer. He was an oarsman who rode front for the Broadford Boat Club and was an expert with single skulls. One day, he won a novice singles regattas on the Charles River and 15 minutes later entered an intermediate race and placed second by only one half lanes. He planned to race in the National Intermediate Road Championship in the Charles River in July. The Brigbird's Dick Bag battle waged in earnest on the long hill of Commonwealth Avenue. On that hill, where is Commonwealth? So Commonwealth is towards the very end there. So Coolidge Corner happens around mm, I'm trying to remember. Oh, I see. Yeah, Commonwealth Avenue happens right out when you come out of the Newton Hills. So that's where we're at. The top of Heartbreak Hill is on Commonwealth Avenue. And it goes down until you get to like Beacon Street. So that's what we're talking about. It's a long stretch sort of there. It's the road you turn off of on Hereford and you take a left on Boylston. So that's that's where that one is. Okay. Uh, Long Hill up the avenue. On that foot, trouble struck Sullivan, who had to stop to remove his shoe. Brignolia wore special shoes with light leather uppers that laced nearly to the toes, rubber heels, and leather soles. By the top of the hill, Brignolia had 200 yards on Grant. Uh, Coolidge Corner, Brick had 11 minutes on Dick and ran five minutes faster than McDonald's course record for 1898. 
when Grant reads Coolidge Corner, what is Coolidge Corner? Coolidge Corner is where they – what is Coolidge Corner? I forget. Coolidge Corner Boston Marathon. I Coolidge Corner is – Ah, uh, da, 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 Let's see. What is Coolidge Corner? Mm-hmm. It's just a part of the race. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. All right. All ran well for Brignolia until St. Mary's. He had conserved, but he didn't see a stone in the road. He turned his ankle and lacking the quickness he might ordinarily have had to balance himself, fell to the ground. He tried to rise, but his trainer seized him and carried him to the grass where he rested for five minutes while they vigorously rubbed him all over. He walked and ran the remaining distance to Exeter Street. There he sprinted. Dick Grant finished three minutes later, and he won the race in 254. Wow. Hmm. Very cool. So now we're at nineteen hundred. So let's go. Now we're on April 19th, 1900. This is the year of Jack Cafferty and Bill Sharing. On April 18th, 1900, the Boston Herald, quote, no weaklings will be permitted to start in the marathon tomorrow. Yikes. 29 people start this race. And these are the conditions. The 19th dawned overcast, but a late morning sun dried the dirt roads except for five or six miles of thick mud ruts along South Framingham. Spectators in boiler hats collapsed their umbrellas, used them as canes, and waited for the start. Canadian businessmen wearing overcoats, pockets stuffed with cash, hoped to make back their money and mourn their bets on a mysterious group of Canadians. On the train to start, the businessmen milled about placing their bets, as did similarly well-heeled Bostonians. Canadian money went to the couple of runners from Ontario named Cafferty and Sherry. Boston betters had never heard of the pair. Temperatures were well past 70 degrees. The overcoats came off. Interesting. So it's a very warm day in Boston. All right. So Lawrence Brignolia is back. And people were betting on him as well as Dick Grant. But now we have these uh, we have these Canadians that are showing up in 1900. No one knows about them. Uh, interesting. So who are these people? Well, John Peter Caffrey, a dark and hearty 20-year-old standing 5'8 and weighing 127 pounds. Oh my gosh. And a boyish William Shearing held the most impressive credentials of the five-man Canadian team. Jack and Billy, as her teammates called them, ran for St. Patrick's Athletic Club in Hamilton and wore a single shamrock on their chest. They intended to challenge the American champions, Brignoli and Grant, the popular and swift former Harvard man now running for the Cambridge gym. Cafferty made his living driving a team of horses and had trained for two months, especially for this race. He spoke modestly when he spoke at, at all about himself. Cafferty had won a big 1898 race in Hamilton by going 19 miles in an hour 54 and had run a 10-mile race in 58 minutes. Jeez. But he had placed second to sharing in the Hamilton Herald Thanksgiving 20-miler 20 20, 20 race. All right. So the runners waited in three rows on the Iron Railroad Bridge in Ashland. They took, they took the train there. All right, at 1130, the motor carriage official starter John Graham arrived at the Ashland Station. Let's go. All right, so we start the race now. 
In true start, the Canadians again took a quick lead, followed by an array of bicycles, carriages, and motor machines. They intended to burn off their competition. John Bowles, who was Grant and Brignolia's handler, took his charges to hold on to the leaders at all hazards. Captain Lombard of the Bicycle Corps, having given each of the men a number that corresponded with that of a runner, instructed them to spread themselves over the first half mile of the course. To avoid confusion, each cyclist picked out his man as they came by, then followed alongside to hand them drinks. That's what they did. The Canadians were flying. 14 miles from home, Brignolia fell out and took a car to the finish. So he cracked. Hmm. The heat had begun to wilt the strongest men. It's a very warm day that day. Brignolia continued to live in Cambridge for the rest of his life. He continued shooting the horses until there were none to shoe. Um, he died in an automobile accident in 1958 at age 82, weighing 300 pounds. Interesting. Uh, Dick Grant was hanging in there. Uh, he trained more, was stronger. He picked his way one by one past the, uh, the Canadians and closed within 100 yards of Cafferty. Cafferty turned to see Grant stalking him. Grant had finished second at Brignola in 1899, and this year he wanted an improved place. Winning the race would do the trick. But all traces of Cafferty's earlier stints advantage, leaving him with plenty of fight. He burst away from the pursuing Grant, who continued to try to overtake the accelerating Canadian. Slowly at first and then more quickly, Grant went to pieces. Sharing similar refresh caught Grant. These two battle for second place. Cafferty approached the new finish line. The crowd's exuberance closed on Cafferty as he closed in the finish line. Through their thickness, he had trouble finding the line. Once he crossed what he believed to be the official finish line, he slipped away from the crowd and through the doors of the BAA clubhouse. Caffrey wanted through the building until he located officials on the third floor. So questions the organized results of the concurrent BAA track meet. Men of wealth and position in the city of Boston, they were not used to being accosted by a sweating, exhausted man who had made his living driving a team of horses. They asked him a surprising question. Had he broken the finishing tape? Had he run through it? Cafferty was astounded. He took that he stood dumbfounded. He had not even seen it. The officials refused to declare him the winner and waved him off. They had work to do. They kept the official clock running as they saw the winner had not yet appeared. Cafferty dutifully, manfully turned and made his way back down three stories while the clock still ticked. He waited through the crowd to the official finish line for the second time, then returned to the clubhouse. No one had yet finished. Cafferty had to go through the building, find the officials and the clock, then persuaded them to stop it. Through crowds and fatigue, Cafferty wandered back to the BA clubhouse, which way to the third floor. Unbelievable. Unbelievable this has happened. So he went through all this. His time was 2.39. Unbelievable. But it was probably five minutes too slow because of what just happened. Wow. Okay. So now we go to April 19th, 1901. All right, Ronald McDonald returns. A Boston College student plans to top the Here we go. So Ronald is back. He seems fit. He's ready to go. People are betting on this race. And we get started 
The weather was right. Let's go. All right, so here we go. Cafferty running in a slouchy style. McDonald looking pretty, pretty up on his toes. Ran with William Davis, a Mohawk Indian from Canada. Fred Houston, the 1900 third place finisher, also from Canada. Crimmins of Cambridge in a rank outside. Sammy Mello of Yonkers, New York, ran together for the early miles. A Greek runner, the first ever entrant not for North America. John Barances kept up the early miles, but blisters forced him to drop out. Blisters. Though another account holds that he ran in the last place from the start, but finished the race out and succeeded in beating one man. But as a Greek dropped out or finished out, another creature dropped in. Between Nottick and Wesley, a horse joined the race. The Boston Daily Globe and the Boston Herald ran conflicting accounts. The Globe reported that applause frightened a horse, causing a dangerous situation, and that only an act of heroism by an unknown cyclist prevented injury. Interesting. The Herald reported, however, that a horse ran away soon after the runners were passing Nottick and having some fool all to himself with a clever wheelsman swept alongside him and brought him to a stop so skillfully that even the runners applauded. Okay, so now we're into Wesley, which is right around mile 13. Uh, Houston led Cafferty, but there Cafferty waked up and caught Houston. Word passed back to McDonald that Cafferty has started on to the finish line. McDonald dug in. He caught Houston at the top of the hill. They raced each other. McDonald prevailed Houston, developed problems with his knee. Later, he fell to the road a couple of times from cramps. At the reservoir, he stopped for help from his attendants. Near this point of the race, a bizarre series of events instigated by McDonald began to unfold. McDonald, who would go on to graduate from Boston College and become a physician, who wound, who would set up practice in his native Antagonist, Nova Scotia, and there spend his days. But if you believe his version of the story, you'll see that he was lucky to live through this marathon. Here we go. McDonald accepted a soap sponge from a stranger in the crowd and curiously held on to it even as he was seized by what appeared to the observers to be cramps. He stopped to walk, and while he did, Hewson, walking himself, passed. Both men, spent in the scourge, retired from the race. Here the story of what happened to McDermott splits into two versions. Dr. Thompson, a physician in tennis to McDonald, says McDonald retired to a car that took him and the sponge to McDonald's home. There the physician examined the sponge and detected chloroform on it. Oh! A reporter asked Dr. Thompson whether he thought that if McDonald was really chloroformed was an intentional or an accident. Thompson replied, it couldn't have been an accident. And when there was so much money up on the race, McDonald claimed that had it not been for the doctor's quick work, the chloroform might have proved fatal. Trainer John Boyles had another version. Boyles accused Dr. Thompson of having given McDonald some pills when he appeared exhausted. But instead of stimulating him, they had the opposite effect. Both cited the case of a Brown University runner, David Hall, in the marathon from Stanford, New York City, who practically collapsed or accepting pills from an outsider. Why would you accept pills? The controversy raged without conclusion for days after the race. Cafferty ran unimpeded and uncontroversial to the finish, jogging much as one would in slippers that were on the point of falling off, just skimming the ground from every monotony of movement. Those who came south to bet on Cafferty, returned to Canada, Canada happy and richer. The Herald reported that as Cafferty actually beat the crazy mark 232 set by the odds makers by three minutes, the result from a financial point of view may be imagined. The rest of the races were nearly a mile behind him and had running to do. The bony Canadian Mohawk William Davis ran with a lopping, deceiving gait, knees wide apart and head erect. The Boston Post reporter saw Davis run utterly devoid of style and squat fashion. Next to him ran a light 111-pound 20-year-old Sammy Melor, who represented the Hollywood Inn Athletic Club. A raw east wind struck both men at the top of the Newton Hills. They fought the wind and each other. The hair reported saw that Davis came home like a wild man, finishing as fresh as many athletes finished runs of the mile. Ten minutes later, Melor strode to the finish line. Cambridge runner Lorden, uh, fifth place, etc. But... Cafferty wins again. Hmm. Interesting. All right. Now we do April 19, 1902. All right. The strenuous life. Medical student favored in the marathon.
Hmm. Okay. All right, who we got here? Now we got... All right, so now we are in... April 1902. All right. This is the year of Sammy Mellor, who was the skinny 111 pounder from the previous year. Okay. So he traveled north from Yonkers to improve in his third place finish the previous year. He worked with his hands, so he typified all that was not genteel in class-conscious America. In the previous year's Thanksgiving Day 20-mile race in Hamilton, Ontario, Mellor defeated McDonald by 10 seconds. Two-time Boston Marathon winner and record holder Jack Cafferty came south from Canada, intending to win again. In record time, J.J. Kennedy, a man with an angelic face, had won the three-mile members' run at the Apollo Garden in Roxbury, Massachusetts, the summer before, and so had sharpened his speed. John C. Loudon of Cambridge had started an eight-mile handicap cross-country race on the previous Saturday but failed to finish. Eugene Estope had again walked from his home in New York to the marathon start line in Ashland. Unbelievable. Thomas J. Hicks, who had finished sixth in each of the past two years, came to improve on that by the maximum. Except for Estope, each man thought winning was a reasonable achievement for himself. Okay, let's go. All right, the money is on Cafferty again, the two-time winner. Whoa, this is crazy. Listen to this. So... The odds maker picked Cafferty with so with while smart money weighed on him. However, dysentery festered in his bowels and catalyzed cramps during his final rub down at Scott's Hotel in Ashland. With so much money riding on him, Cafferty decided there on the starting line to take the safe route and not run at all. Yikes. Leaving the road clear for McDonald and Mellor. With Cafferty gone, the odds makers had to make new odds. So here we go. McDonald and Mellor ran side by side for the first 12 miles. All the way now, we're going towards uh, Wesley. Mellor wore number 11 on a white shirt with white knee length pants. Hair part in the middle, topped his head, which looked like a small on a little boy, would look small on a little body. The Globe reporter writing in his flagship Crestmobile wrote that Mellor was continually gazing far across the fields and woods and appeared to be all absorbed in the scenery of the countryside as if he were engaging in a morning constitutional rather than a race. Ugh. McDonald, a head taller and 30 pounds heavier, wore blue. Charles Moody, a high schooler from Nautic, was, was taller but thinner than McDonald and moved what the Globe reporter saw a business-like stride. As the race grew more serious, the leaders seemed to be fencing with each other without consideration for time or distance or any of the other racers. First, Miller would carry reward McDonald with his little staff to speed. Then McDonald would respond with a thrust of his own. Then Miller would, purry, would parry by slipping behind the bigger man. Okay. Now we're in the Wesley Hills. McDonald slowed. A carriage load of his supporters urged him on, administering restoratives and sponging his head. So 13 miles. McDonald could not respond to the administration and not speak to their exhortations. Instead, he rubbed his hand in a circular motion on his stomach. Then he began to walk. Maybe he was hungry. I don't know. 
Word reached John Loudon by way of his elated handlers that up ahead McDonald was walking. Lorden caught McDonald, but McDonald started running again with that pretty stride of his. Lorden fell in behind and waited. As they ran downhill into Newton Lower Falls, Lorden tossed into a bust in, in a burst, and McDonald tottered to the sidewalk. A so the Globe reporter wrote. Maybe that reporter had previously covered boxing, but Lorden never laid a glove on McDonald. McDonald waited there until his brother arrived in the wagon to collect him and drive him home. Quickly, Hicks passed McDonald, but his name did not appear in the top 12 in the final results. But then Meller had left the dusty country roads behind and skimmed the, the, skimmed the macadam on Washington Street at Auburndale. The Globe reporter, pressing his baller hat to, head, to his head on the Crescent Hill, zipped the long road. I quote, Every foot of the course, from the reservoir to Coolidge Corner, both sides of the boulevard were black with shrieking spectators and Brookline's rear aristocracy leaned out of the windows and waved lace handkerchiefs in the April breeze as the white shadow wended his way, acknowledging the salutations with smile and a nod. This guy seems to be running like he's not even tired. One of the saluters at Coolidge Corner was none other than Jack Cafferty himself. His dysentery had taken fur long enough for him to run several tests from Meller, shake his hand, and wish him well. Within a year, the two would not be on speaking terms. Interesting. Uh, Meller was free to win as he pleased. He ended up winning by two minutes, but pains in his ankles threatened his victory more than Kennedy. By Chestnut Hill, Meller had a four-minute lead on Kennedy, but Meller won in a time much slower than Caffrey's record, saying, if it hadn't been for the painful ankles, I would have broken the record. Miller wanted that record and resolved to get it someday at any cost. Kennedy, the runner no one bothered to time last year, finished two minutes and nine seconds later. Looking to stress, Lorden finished alone over 10 minutes behind the winner, but he had improved in the previous year's fifth place. It was not a man who had made up his mind to win the Boston Marathon. At 27 years old, Lorden had been running since he was 16, but mostly as a sprinter. He went back to his job working 10 hours a day in the shipping department at the pump manufacturing company in East Cambridge. He trained mostly at night under gas lights when he could find them. Official 1902 results. Sam Mailer wins. Hmm. Okay. Here we go. April 20th, 1903. Let's go. This one is called In Defiance of the Doctor, Melor Determined to Break Cap. Let's get a picture of Melor. Let's see. Sam Melor Boston Marathon. Here we go. Let's look at this. Let's take, let's take a picture of him. Here he is. Look at this guy. Skinny guy. Super skinny. Hmm. And nineteen oh two. No to Boston Marathon. Let's pull that up. That's the leaderboard. Is it going to go back that far? Nineteen oh two. 240 through 12. That's where we're at. Hmm. Interesting. All right. Let's go. This is the 1903 Boston Marathon. We know he's not going to win. Let's see what happens. Hmm. 
So here we go. Now we have Sam has shown up along with John Lorden, who finished third place last year. Mm hmm. All right, so it looks like the story of 1903 is that so, – so this is what's interesting. So the winner of the 1903 marathon, um, John Lorden, in the morning, Lorden presented himself for registration in the marathon. The registration official asked Lorden if he had been examined by a physician. Lorden replied that, yes, he had. Dr. Fleur's letter remained safely tucked in his pocket. The official gave Lorden his next race number, and he made for the starting line. But whatever condition Dr. Fleur had diagnosed lingered in his intestines. Interesting. So actually what happened is on the night before the Boston Marathon in 1903, Irish immigrant John C. Lorden visited the offices of Dr. J.F. Fair in East Cambridge. The doctor examined Lorden, who, wrote, who then wrote the following letter, quote, this is the survey that I have advised Mr. John Lord not to participate in the race that held on Monday, April 19th, owing to trouble with his bowels, which are now not in a healthy condition at the present time. <laughs> That's funny. So, but then he does it anyways. That's what's interesting to me. He does it anyways. I'm going to post this. This is a really interesting story, I think. So let's do this. This is good, I think. Let's take a picture of this. The winner of the 1903 Boston Marathon was explicitly <laughs> told not to run the day before by his doctor. Some things never change. I love it. Never change. You know, join us all week live on YouTube. Well, I think that's funny. We're going to post that. We'll post that. Let's see, how do we do this? We'll post a picture here. Actually, let's do this.
Anyways, all right, so here we go. So he's doing it. Let's go. So we start. All right. Midway to South Framington, Meller called Cafferty. Both men began to hammer themselves thin as they distanced themselves from the pack. So now we're at Meller and Cafferty, the, the legends. And not to J.J. Kennedy ran 600 yards behind the leaders, along with his boyish but smartly Mike Sprig from Brooklyn, wearing the blue Maltese cross of pastime AC. Lorden, in your innards under control, so it worked out, was pursued by a crowd-pleasing childlike 16-year-old named Arthur Ziegler, and at last, the mischievous Fred Lawrence of, of New York followed. About 300 bicycles, the Herald's photo automobile, a St. Louis gasoline runabout, and the Globe's flag-flying white steamer Crestman were parallel the leaders. The Herald reporter was so impressed with his conveyance in an automobile that he dedicated six paragraphs of his marathon story to describing his ride. At Wesley, Mortar trotted over to Cafferty and eyed him from head to heel. Hmm. After a few sarcastic remarks, Miller jumped in front. Both men played to the crowds in Newton Lower Falls. Caffrey doffed his cap and Miller waved. Miller ran away up Auburn to Hill, but Caffrey caught him at the Washington Street and Commonwealth Avenue corner. As the leader swung around from the Auburn Hotel into the boulevard, both squared away for the hill. There, Miller crossed over to the concrete gutter that, that ran beside the trolley tracks. Here, Caffrey encountered difficulty. His running form deteriorated, and he seemed to be experiencing stomach problems. Lorden, meanwhile, had overcome his own intestinal trouble and felt stronger and stronger. I quote, I kept coming, getting stronger, you know, he would say after the race. Kennedy ran in third, but dropped out at Auburndale. Lorden passed man after man until ahead of him remained the death duel between Cafferty and Melor. Cafferty, looking used up, fell onto the grass with, with leg cramps. Lorden ap approached as Caffrey's handlers rubbed his legs to banish the cramping. Caffrey saw him coming and rose to his feet, but he could not run. He tried to hail a watering wagon, but the driver did not understand and did not stop. Caffrey, the fastest man ever over the Boston Marathon course, was helpless. He accepted further aid from his handlers, but at last had to retire from the race. He was driven to the finish line in a carriage inconsolable. Mm-hmm. And that turned out to be his last race there. Hmm. Ended up passing away from the Spanish flu. Uh, Lorden catches Melor. And he ends up winning the race. So he went to the race in 241-29 in 1903. Pretty cool. So that's there. Now we're in 1904. Michael Spriggs going to win. Interesting. The streak of yellow. Lorden Meller, cream of the marathon field. All right, so now let's do 1903, 1904, sorry, April 19, 1904. So this is April 19, 1904. Let's go. On the other side of the world from Boston in 1904, the Japanese fought the Russians and by April shocked the Western world because it was – they, who controlled the seas, were maybe superior in size and technology to the neglected Tsar's forces. This is the Russo-Japanese war they're talking about. Ships themselves have become bigger and faster. This is the air of the battleship. I have a cool photo up there. Love that air in naval history. 
The Boston newspapers reported on the Russo-Japanese War on most of their April front pages, but on April 20th, replaced the world news with that of the local conflict in the marathon. Marathoners had become faster, too, and competition denser and the fields bigger. The old world order was changing. The old marathon order was changing along with the world. A record number of runners turned out to race the Boston Marathon in 1904. Technical details changed for the marathon, too. Automobiles, the superior technological conveyance in the opinion of the Herald Reporter, who had written so profusely in 1903 about the thrills of riding in one, replaced bicycles as the transportation used by the runner's handlers. Okay? All right? Let's go. So in Ashland, which is the start of the race, I actually am curious now. Uh, Boston Marathon Course. So they're starting in Ashland, but the race now stops in Hopkinton. So I see, which is about a mile. Ah, I see. It's about a mile back from where it starts today, a mile in front, because the race is only 25 miles then. Is that right? Yeah, I think that's right. Okay. In Ashland, the 118-pound, 20-year-old named half-miler Michael Sprigg, designer of powerhouses for the Edison Company, pulled on his racing shoes. They were old shoes but had new soles. The cobbler, though he had left big stitches inside without hammering them. But there was nothing Sprigg could do about the poor cobbling. The race was about to begin. He did not expect to win. He had not won anything in two years. He had thought that winning did not really suit him. He felt he lacked the courage. He had tried boxing but had given up, blaming his previous year's third-place finish on weakness caused by his attempt to make weight for the 115-pound class for boxing. Okay. Interesting. Mm. He had won in 1902 and intended to win again. Mellor had plenty of courage, perhaps too much. Okay. Fred Lortz, the fourth-place man in 1903, when John Lord and one came back, he didn't seem to have a great deal of emotional involvement in this or any race. Loris crowned himself with a devil-may-care attitude. Running was fun, and he was having it. It was better than his day job laying bricks. Love it. Okay? So, Lorden went last year. Lord himself returned to defend. He reasoned that Cafferty had won twice. Why shouldn't John Lorden? He had no medical problems, but perhaps because he had no problems to distract him, he thought too much. Maybe the thinking weighed him down. Tom Hicks, running for the Cambridge YMCA, had come in from Minneapolis for some serious running. He had not run in Boston the year before, but this was his fourth attempt to win there. He had run 307 back in 1900, 252 in 1901, each for sixth place, and did not finish in 1902. Perhaps Hicks had not done enough thinking about race tactics. Later in the year, Hicks would win the Olympic gold medal in St. Louis under dreadful conditions of heat and dust. But in Ashland, skies were overcast. The day blew chilly. The prizes offered by the BAA were large gold and silver loving cups. All right, here we go. The race starts. Meller took the early lead. He ran erect. His little body was a perfect machine. He slipped over the miles, oblivious of the receding competition, but oblivious as well of the invisible deterioration of his own body. Winning was not enough for Meller. He had to win big. Driven by the grudge, he still held against Cafferty because of the incident in Hamilton in 1902. He wanted Cafferty's course record. Loris Sprig, sorry, Spring, Tom Cook, and Bill Schallbaum waited. They were either fearful or not hungry enough to challenge Miller. Hicks ran leisurely in eighth place the field filled through South Framingham. By Wesley Hills, it was Spring, who tried but could not close on Miller. Miller seemed slightly bent forward, refusing to stop slamming himself after the record. The bending continued, and Miller slowed in proportion, or perhaps he slowed and bent. It was not clear to Miller or anyone which was the cause and which was the effect. Spring could not help but gain on Mellor. For Lorden, the burden of having run the race over and over in his mind in the nights before proved too heavy to carry. It forced him to retire from the race in Wesley. That's only 13 miles in. By Auden, Auburndale. Where is Auburndale? Auburndale. 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 Uh, Auburndale is where on the course? Wesley's here. 
Mm-hmm. Where is Auburndale? Let's see. Let's let's switch from here to where is Auburndale? Where is Auburndale on Boston course? Mm. Let's see what it says. Auburndale is right here. This is Auburndale. So here, this is where they're at. By Auburndale, Spring pulled Ewan Mellor and pushed ahead into the lead over Commonwealth Avenue Hill. Spring ran up the hill but walked up the other. Still, he maintained his lead. He ate three oranges. He kept his moistened handkerchief in his mouth. Mellor was not out of sight. At Coolidge Corner, which is right around mile 23 now, uh, totally bent over and slowed to shuffling. Uh, capitulated to walk. Four more men marched past. The last of them were affable Fred Loris. Later, Hicks charged by looking full of energy. Meanwhile, another part of Commonwealth Avenue, the steep hill in Brighton, which is where's the Brighton Hill? It's before Heartbreak. It's like right here. Another race unfolded. Gasoline cars defeated steamers and electrics. Okay. After his finish in the marathon, Spring found himself at last down to fighting weight of 112 and a half pounds. He said, I'm sort of surprised at winning, as always thought there was a streak of yellow in me. I can't say that I'll go to St. Louis, the Olympics, to compete. Spring had made up his mind that he would not run another big race. Hicks came sprinting out of the Irmington Oval for the second place. He had miscalculated, starting his charge too late. Both Hicks and Lawrence would go on to St. Louis, and what happened there would, be, would change forever. Hmm. Interesting. This is good. I like this one.
All right, we're going to let the YouTube world know here. All right, so this is Boston Marathon Week, and in honor of the Boston Marathon, huge fan. is probably the reason I kind of started running and getting serious about it. We are going to do something maybe stupid. This is a great history book on the Boston Marathon. It covers every year up until – oh, geez – modern times it may not have the most recent years but we'll fill in those gaps um i'm going to be reading through this book and recounting the different stories of the boston marathon tune in me live streaming on youtube probably also be putting it up on facebook live um tune in when you want if you want to hear a little bit about it or you can check out the recordings but a lot of really good interesting history in the boston marathon and it is it's a lot of fun reading about it. This is a big week. Let's see. Yes. All right. So this, this is Boston Marathon. All right, that's what we're going to do. Let's get one more in here. All right, we're going to go to 1905 now. Let's go. All right, so this is Boston Marathon. Oh, this is going to be a good one. So now here we go. Now, now we're in 1905. We are talking 1905. So what do we got? 1905. So this is April 19th, 1905. Okay. Cheater to run marathon. Interesting. Interesting. So let's see. Let's see what happens here. All right. Let me send this live. All right, here we go. Boston Marathon. We are, this is April 19th, 1905. Cheater to run marathon. All right, here we go. This is good. This is the year that. Uh, Frederick Lors is going to win, who's been nabbing at it for a while. But here's the background. All right. A shadow controversy had been following Fred Lors since the previous summer. He could run well. He knew it. He enjoyed running and had not taken it seriously until now. He had placed fourth and fifth in Boston in the last two years, 
but his antic at the St. Louis Olympic Games haunted him. No one would let him forget it. On a mad dog midsummer Midwest day, running on a churned up dusty roads, Loris had dropped out of the Olympic marathon. To race on a day like that stretched beyond his own craziness. As he rode in a car to the finish, he waved to the runner still on the course. Then a whim seized him. He jumped out of the car and ran into the stadium, accepted the cheers of the crowd, and took a victory lap. Still no other runner had appeared. It was a grand comedy, no doubt propelled by the endorphins, and Laura stood about to take the gold medal from Alice Roosevelt, the daughter of President Teddy, when tired, hot, dusty officials who had followed Tom Hicks as he ran walked and coughed along every step of the route, drove him to the stadium, and accused Lawrence of cheating. He didn't deny it. He laughed. He was joking. The temperature reached over 100 degrees Fahrenheit on the course. Nobody could have run that fast. Didn't they get it? The judges did not share Laura's sense of humor. Um, I don't know. I think that's a little bit crazy he did it. But I think what's interesting is, can you read any history book from this period and have Teddy Roosevelt not be a significant historical figure in it? I, you know, the other moment I had like this, I remember reading a history book on the Wright brothers from David McCullough and who was the first president to fly on an airplane? Teddy Roosevelt. So big fan of Teddy Roosevelt. I have a ton of books on him up on the shelf, but of course his daughter, Alice, his oldest daughter, Alice, um, the daughter of Berger, his first wife, who passed away in childbirth, of course, she would feature prominently in this history book on the Boston Marathon. Of course, that would happen right now. I, I, what else would happen? Anyway, so here we go. So he says he's joking. I don't know. That seems a little bit sketchy to me. So in any case, he's the cheater. He's showing up at the, the starting line for the 1905 Boston Marathon. He's going to end up winning it, um, but he has this controversy heading over him, which is kind of interesting. So here we go. All right, so now we're back to Ashland. So the Ashland start, the starting line didn't move back to Hopkinton until uh, much later from now. So actually, so here you go. So they're starting here at Ashland, which is, if you can see, it's about three miles from, it's about mile three where the current course is. Um, and it also finished that a little bit further away. So that's the big difference here. But anyway, so this is where the starting line is in 1905 still. Here we go. All right. So at the Ashland starting line, Loris had more to worry about than his own reputation. Past winner, Sammy Mellor, so one-time winner, almost two-time winner, uh, who won in 1902. John Lorden, who won in 1903. Michael Spring, who won last year. Each intended to win again. Tom Hicks had an Olympic gold medal, but only a second place finish in Boston. Melor, the man who charged to the front last year, was hell bent on a record pace. He said, quote, because I failed last year, many think I've gone back and cannot repeat my performance in 1902. You have to feel right to win sets of races this is going to be. And I can safely say that this year I feel right. Of course, the field is a big one and a good one, but my hopes are high and I believe I will reach the finish line first. Again, all right, let's go, Sam. Uh, Spring had said in 1904 that he would not go to the Olympic Games, which he didn't, but he also had said that he would not run another big race. He had been surprised to win the year before in spite of his self-admitted streak of yellow. Just before the 1905 race, he told the Boston Post, quote, I am out for a new record in this year's run. I weigh 119 pounds and feel fine. This guy's interesting. I think maybe because of his boxing background, he's kind of obsessed about weight. So if you remember in 1904, when he's talking to the, the newspaper as well, he's talking about his weight. He finished the race at 112 pounds, which I think is crazy. Uh, but now he's at 119, which he thinks is his fighting race. So he's like, let's go. Uh, the Post reported on April 14th, Springs entry assures the management of the great run that he will be the greatest of the annual runs from Ashland into the Exeter Street Clubhouse. Exeter Street. Can you see that on here? Hmm. No. Actually, you know what would be kind of interesting is to see a comparison of the old and the new Boston Marathon, old and new Boston Marathon courses. Let's see if someone has done that. That would be kind of interesting to see. Let's see if there's an image on Google. 
of the old versus the new course lapped on top of each other. Uh, here, what if I look for the original Boston Marathon course? Let's see if I can get an image for that one. Ah! Let's see, Ashland, no, 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 no. Hmm. We need the first course. Where is the original Boston Marathon course? I uh, can't find it. Okay, that's fine. Doesn't matter. Here we go. Mm -hmm. All right, so race day, let's go. On race day, a mild quartering wind blew over most of the course. So they talk about quartering because in that time period, the Navy was doing a lot of the reporting of the meteorology, and that's a naval term. Quartering means, and this is a good, there's a great fictional series by, um, Oh my God, it's Patrick O'Brien, a naval series, and he uses a lot of words. And so I have a, a naval dictionary, believe it or not. And he talks about quartering. So let's get a good definition for quartering here. Quartering, I, I know what it is, but let's explain it here. Uh, quartering, 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 quartering. Here we go, quarter. All right, quartering. Mm. Uh, All right, a C is said to quarter when it strikes a vessel on the quarter. What is a quarter? Is the upper part, the upper after parts of a ship's side as in the starboard quarter, between the after part of the main chains and the sterns. So the stern is the back, the main chains is in the middle, and so it's sort of that back quadrant of a ship is the quarter. So you can imagine it's kind of blowing against your, your side there. So that's what quartering means. All right. On a race day, a mild quartering wind blew over most of the course. A tall, thin high school boy named Chuck Nury from Nantic Took the early lead as he had the year before. Okay. Uh, and Wesley Meller responded to the cheers of the, of the college girls by boldly bursting away from the field. Mark and Lores ran together in an easy, restful stride. Mark gave Lores a drink of the special tonic that he prepared in New York. Special tonic. Interesting. What is this special tonic that he had? Hmm. Let's see. Does he talk about what the special tonic is? Interesting. Okay, great. Uh, by Auburndale, the aggressive running of Plunky Sammy. So Auburndale is right here. The aggressive running of Plunky Sammy, as the papers in the day called him, brought him one minute behind Cafferty's record. Here, your struggle. Miller was too much for him by Brighton. Brighton? Which is over here. In Commonwealth, um, he had failed. The winds with a thousand people watching the electric streetcars that followed the race along Commonwealth Avenue. Miller looked sure to win again. He crested the hill but began to falter on the descent toward the reservoir at Chestnut Hill. So, this is where we're at. He wanted the record and win, but cramps in his quadrants had made it impossible to take advantage of the downhill. He could not run, his body did not work yet. He kept forcing it. Depression set in when his body told him that a record was still outside of his reach. By mile 22, all enthusiasm had drained from Miller's body. He yielded to fatigue. He surrendered. He walked. Miller now traveled at half Laura's speed. Laura's had separated himself slightly from Marks on Beacon Street. When he saw Miller walking, he ran humorously past. Miller had no fight left. Marks followed. Miller quit the race. Difficulties caught up with Laura's by Coolidge Corner. His handlers implored him to win. Keep at it, Fred. Keep at it. Only a little more. For heaven's sake, keep at it. Mark's coming. They poured water on his head and swathed him with sponges as he ran. As a reminder 
these guys had handlers in those days. There was only like, you know, well, now there's 70 of them. At the time, there was only 20 of them, 18 in the first race. And so they they drove behind them. Well, they drove alongside them in automobiles and would hand them water and sponges and things like that. So that's what they're talking about. Uh, the undisciplined crowds left a zigzag made behind Laura to confuse Mark so he could no longer see the leader at Massachusetts Avenue. So now we're at the end here. Massachusetts Avenue is it's down here, like in this area. Mm -hmm. uh, a jumbo of bicycles and automobiles clawed into a tangle directly in front of Lawrence. One of his handlers on a bike fell in front of him. He leaped like a bird over the phone rider and kept on amid the cheers. There inside of the finish line, tape Lawrence encountered his biggest obstacle. Steps before the tape, a bicycle was swerved and tangled up with Lawrence, who fell forward, tumbled, and smashed the tape on their way to the ground. Oh my gosh. He says, I quote, it's a cinch to run 25 miles. I never walked from the start. Well, I may be, but try running 26.2. Hmm. He ran in 238.25. Interesting. It's a cinch to run 25 miles. I never walked from the start. Yes, try running. LOL. That's funny. I think that's pretty good. I'm going to post that as kind of the quote of the 1905 race, which I think is always kind of funny. I wonder if I can take a picture. Can you take a picture? Let's see. No, I don't think you can. Let's try it anyways. I'll take a picture of this one. I think that's funny. Let's see what he says. <laughs> I think that's funny. Boston Marathon. That's good. We'll put that up there. That's good. So that's 1905. Hmm. Let's do let's do one more and then we'll call it a day. We'll call it an afternoon. April 19th, 1906. A rather slow plumber's helper. So who wins this race? Okay. Let's go. Mm-hmm.
Oh, wow. So in this race, this is this is the race in 1906. Here we go. This is kind of the, the key part. All right. Meanwhile, Meller battled against a chilly headwind. David Neeland of Roxbury ran with Meller. Neeland had placed six in the St. Louis Olympics and at Boston the year before was the reigning New England five-mile champion. For a living, he hustled whole. He weighed 123 pounds. There's this obsession with weight back then. He boasted of having never taken a day off work because of his running. In Wesley, Hicks began to walk. He walked all the way to the finish. That's 13 miles he walked. Miller quit the race in Wesley with no effort on Ford's part. He is his place in proof. He ate two oranges. Neelan, alone in the lead, faced a dilemma as well as a headwind. Ugh. How much should he conserve himself and defend his lead? Might he burn himself up in an attempt at a big victory? His handlers advised him. A hundred bicycles churned up dust around him. Most of it blew back in his face. Neelan ran up the first long kill in Newton. His graceful stride, there's four of them. His graceful stride served him well. He walked up the next hill, that's number two, then he ran. While Ford was chewing his straw, Neelan had bashed out the miles with Miller. Now that the fight began to show his bruises, elevated eyebrows proclaimed internal distress. Ford chewed, ran, and closed. He's chewing a straw. Interesting. Why is he chewing a straw? Hmm. Uh, let's see. Neelan's sleek legs were stretched for greater activity. Neelan could hear the people cheering for Ford. Neelan bent his body forward, straining every fiber, and there was a look of agony on his face. Crossing the bridge just before Commonwealth Avenue, a wagon broke down in front of Neelan. Again, he walked. He discouraged, his discouraged coaches applied sponges and epithets to cheer. Ford was nearer now. Neelan saw with eyes that blinked with fatigue and despair, a diminutive figure in green trunks shoot past him. Later, Ford said, after I trailed him some distance, I knew I had him. I could see his knees were wobbly, but the race was not over for Ford. A cyclist fell directly in front of him. He had to sidestep quickly. The crowd pressed so close that Ford had to slow down to penetrate it. He had to shepherd his own way. Neelan followed the part of the path where he gained the four because he could move more easily. Even on Exeter Street's final straightaway, Ford had to slow while the official vehicles made a path through the crowd for him. Neelan gained, Ford smiled. Six seconds later, Neelan finished. Wow, at the finish line, beat him. The closest finish of all 10 Boston marathons. It was also a lot slower than Kaepernick's record. Rather slow, read the Daily Globe's headline. But still... Pretty good. Hmm. Okay. What if we can get, let's do, let's do one more. Let's do 1907. 1907, the most favored favorite, Canadian Indian longboat unbeatable. Okay. This is the year of longboat. Who was Tommy Longboat? All right, this is pretty good. Here we go. H. H. Potter, a half Sioux Indian living in Roxbury and running for the local athletic association, trained for the BA marathon and entered for the eighth year. His hope, as he expressed it to reporter, was to have the pleasure of meeting Mr. Thomas Longboat. Longboat was an Anagata Indian from Canada who had become an instant legend as a long distance runner. 
Potter was not a mere fan, but also a serious contender for the Boston Marathon. He had finished better than 14th. He had always finished better than 14th. Potter, however, never mentioned racing and defeating Longboat or even dreamed to do so. He had only wanted to shake his hand. When Tim Ford, who won the marathon last year, was quite unknown, but a year later he was a favorite to win. The Boston, with his backers, could find few people willing to take their bets at any odds. The Longboat legend grew quickly, but as the origins of the 1901 Boston Marathon, okay? In 1901, Canadian Mohawk Indian Bill Davis finished second to the Canadian Jack Cafferty. Both had broken Cafferty's year-old course record. In subsequent years, as Davis suffered a series of setbacks and languished in return to retirement, he heard a story about a teenage Indian on the reservation near Caledonia, 15 miles from his hometown of Hamilton, Ontario. He heard that a boy could run. He heard tall stories. As the stories report in the Sunday edition of the Boston Post, young Longboat had accompanied his family on a wagon drawn by a couple of greys, for a rare visit to Hamilton. The boy was told that a team would leave at 3 p.m. with or without him. As he appointed an hour, the, the city still held the boy in its spell and did not release him until 5. His strict family had indeed left without him the wagon. Whoa. Davis saw Tom Longboat and urged him to train seriously. Longboat had been born on June 4th, 1887, the log cabin on the Six Nations Reserve near Brantford, Ontario. He carried the unnagger name of Kagwagi, which means everything. Tall Longboat's father died when he was boy, leaving his mother to raise a family of two sons and his daughters of rural poverty. Longboat had, in fact, already been training for racing. He happily covered miles and miles of rolling farm country in the west bank of the Grand River in the Six Nations Reserve. On April 24, the Toronto Telegram printed this, quoting an Indian guide. I quote, <clears throat> Tommy practiced running two years. He ran every morning and every night. He run down at the council on the 24th of May and got beaten. Then he come home and run more. He run around this block. It's five miles and a half around, and Tommy gets so he run in 23 and a half minutes. Next 24th of May, Tommy go down to the council and run again. It's a mile race, and Tommy win by nearly a quarter of a mile. That was a, a quote from, the, from an Indian guide. So that's just kind of how it sounded. Um, so Tommy Longboat's the man. Davis is coaching him. And Davis's strategy was mm -hmm. so he's got a strategy. So here we go. All right. Oh, this is interesting. This is his training regimen they're talking about. His training consisted of a systematic increase in distance distances run on the measure concession roads on the reserve, then running into neighboring towns. Once after running from once after returning from running and walking, he told his mother he had gone to Dunville and back a total of 50 miles. She told him she'd throw him out of the house if he ever lied to her again. But more than merely chalking up brutal mileage, Longboat allowed himself a full recovery from his hard effort so his body had time to strengthen itself between the next onslaught. These training principles remained sound for the next century and served Longboat well into Boston. Hmm. Okay. All right, so here we go. Now we go to the race. Through Wesley, leader Lee ran a minute inside Cafferty's record. Just before the junction of Washington Street and Commonwealth, Longboat passed Lee, but to the surprise of the streetcar riders and other watchers, Petch ran stride for stride for Longboat. A snow squall struck on the hills. The Boston wrote under the subhead, Hills had no terror for Redskin, and that these hills killed off Petch and caused him to drop back, but the noble son of the Ndangagas did not seem to notice them. From there, Lombo ran alone, swiftly and easily smashing Caffrey's record with each drive. So he basically destroyed the coast record. Hmm. Course record. He never came back to Boston. Uh... Did some other stuff. He 
turn pro. And then in 1916, Lombo volunteered to serve in the Great War and joined the 180th Sportsman Battalion. So he was Canadian. So he joined the war along with Great Britain as one of their dominions. Uh, joined the Sportsman Battalion. So what is this about? Longbow competed in military races and once again assigned to the dangerous job of carrying messages from the one battlefield post to another in France. Because in this era of the World War, there wasn't really good communication. There wasn't – so that's how you had to carry messages. So he was a runner, literally. He was wounded and reported dead, leading to a jolting personal experience and a return to Canada in 1919. His wife, Loretta, had remarried. The development was wretching for both of them, but happy as she was to see Longboat alive, Loretta decided to remain in her new marriage. Oh, brutal. Longboat accepted his loss and later remarried and had four children. Mm. Crazy story. So that's Tommy Longboat. He appeared on the scene, and then he disappeared. Now we go to 1908. No favorite at all. April 20th, 1908. So April 20th, 1908. So who wins this year? This is one by Thomas P. Morrissey. Okay. Interesting. No one had a favorite this year. Okay. Hmm. So here's the recap of the race. Here we go. It was a day for records. No dust blew on the roads because cooling snowflakes and a drizzle kept the day perfect for rapid, sweatless running. Okay. During all this speeding, John Hayes sat back in 32nd place in South Framington, and behind him waited Mike Ryan in 38th. Ryan carried with him an enormous well of self-confidence, self-assertion, and pride. He knew he could finish far ahead of his present place. Even the rambunctious Sam Miller waited calmly in 13th place. But Fowler, Jimmy Lee... The fine featured fifth place runner of the previous year, and a gang of others hovered moments behind the brazen Welton. Lee wore the unicorn symbol of the BAA. The host hopes weighed on him. Wouldn't it be nice if a golden haired boy of the BAA could win their road race? This dream would haunt the BAA for the next half century. Fowler swung between his relentless to win quickly and the temperance that experience had taught him. But in the middle stages, he ran abreast of Lee as grim, cold cyclists followed, waiting to see who would crack. Welton cracked in Wesley. As the Boston Herald put it, quote, a sickly smile to his rivals told of Welton's disappointment and his physical inability to reach his goal. Fowler and Lee raced each up the Newton Hills on to the boulevard now called Beacon Street. Hmm. They knew nothing of what and who waited behind them. A not-quite-20-year-old electrician's assistant from Yonkers looked behind him. Thomas P. Morrissey, running for the Mercury AC, ran with a lock of his black hair swinging on his forehead. He had a workman's muscular arms and wore ankle-high tennis shoes. Fascinating. He weighed 133 and a half pounds. Unnoticed. You know, I, this occurred to me. They have all these weights because the doctors are doing the, the weigh-ins before the race this time of year. So that's how they know all this. Unnoticed, he had been unconsidered before the race, but was not unaccomplished. Morrison had been third in Boston the slow year in 1906 with a 253 for 25 miles, 
But in 1907, he had finished a dismal 17th. But to redeem himself, he had won the National Indoor 25-mile championship in New York and shortly thereafter placed 10th in the New York Yonkers Marathon. He had trained running 10 to 15 miles three nights a week and walked on three other nights. Hmm. He went a 20-miler once every three weeks. The Boston Post reported that on Sundays he went to Vespers. He didn't expect to win, but he did expect to place in the top three. So Morrissey struck this guy to let him to rendezvous with the first place runner at St. Paul Street. Behind Morrissey, Hayes. No, this is awful. Listen to this. Morrissey struck this guy to let him to rendezvous with the first place finisher at St. Paul Street. The record does not show whether it was Fowler or Lee who clung to the lead longest. The Globe reported that, quote, on came Morrissey as relentlessly as an Indian seeking vengeance, unquote. Nothing seemed in Morrissey's way once he took the lead except an insistent young man wearing a cap. That was a night that was 1906 winner Tom Ford wearing the cap, riding in an automobile next to Morrissey. Morrissey, fearing disqualification for accepting aid and coaching for someone other than the BAA assigned handler, though he told Ford to go away, Ford would not quit coaching. Morrissey snatched Ford's cap off his head and tossed it into the crowd, forcing Ford to choose between continuing to kibitz and his lucky hat. Ford ran for the hat, and Morrison ran for the finish, unaided to a solo victory as he broke the red woolen string across Exeter Street. Wow. Mm. That's pretty cool. So now we're going to do the last one, and then we'll take a break for the afternoon. The Inferno. Marathon Mania grips Boston. So now we're in 1909. Ooh. So the winner of 1909 is going to finish in 253, which is 20 minutes slower than last year. So it was a hot, hot year. This is a cool passage. All right. An editor in New York Times on February 24, 1999 instructed, quote, It is only the exceptional man who can safely undertake the running of 26 miles, and even for them, the safety is comparative rather than absolute. The chances are that every one of them weakens his heart and shortens his life, not only by the terrible strain of the race itself, but by the preliminary training, which produces muscular and vascular developments that become perilous instead of advantageous the moment a return to ordinary pursuits and habits put an end to the need for them. For the great majority of adults, particularly in the urban population, to take part in a marathon race is to risk serious and permanent injury to health, with immediate death a danger not very remote, and is very little better than criminal to let growing boys make any such demands upon their powers of endurance. For boys, indeed, even the shorter races are a very questionable desirability, since at any distance the expenditure of energy under the stimulus of competition is excessive. The truth is that exercise should always be purely subordinate to the business of pleasure, to the business and pleasure of life. 
to make it or the bodily changes it produces and the incident is to, as well as an absurd mistake. Interesting. So that was what doctors were saying in 1909. Oh, man. Times change. It's like we learn things all the time. Now, you know, I just got done reading about how VO2 max, like what Peter Atia talks about in his book, is one of the best predictors of longevity. And here we're talking about how to exercise is bad for your health. Hmm. All right, here we go. On April 19th, a warm southward flow of air brought what was then a high record temperature, 84 degrees to Boston with high humidity. Worse still, the ill wind blew more or less at the runner's back, more or less at the same speed they ran. Still, ill followed them. air followed them. Sweat pulled on their skin and dripped off rather than evaporating. Even... And even still air, runners generated enough wind by their own motion so that sweat evaporated to cure away excessive heat. But on this day, the racers stewed in their own juices. There was none of the snowflakes and drizzle the previous two years to cool off their hot skin. With no recent experience running in heat, runners expected fast times and planned to, to run to get them. Disaster awaited. Mm. Mm. It's a hot day. Wow. Well, that's going to finish the first half of this, which is great. It's a pretty cool graphic. Crap. Good stuff. So when we come back next, we're going to do the next 10 years, which will be during the Great War. So that'll be exciting. All right. Good stuff. Uh, good first start to the stream.